friends. Hello, brothers. This is Justin with Masonic Improvement. And Dennis with Masonic Improvement. And we are extremely happy to have with us tonight Larry Fitzpatrick, who is, you know, all you guys probably remember him as the chair of, of officer leadership training, but he's he's been so much more to this fraternity. He's he's one of my mentors and 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 I, I, I love him to death. And, and if you want a, a, an intelligent discussion, he's the man to find at Grand Lodge. But you probably won't find him because that's where all the Grand Masters go when they want an intelligent ins- conversation. So <laughs> thank also, you for coming, Larry. Also want to give a huge shout out. I don't know if, you, if you're watching this on YouTube, you probably noticed that Dennis is actually joining us from space today. That is a testimony of his dedication to Sonic Improvement and the Fraternity. <laughs> hey, yeah. thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate the opportunity. Larry, I would like to start off. I know you've had a pretty big hand in several of the resolutions that we are going to be voting on at the upcoming uh, Grand Lodge. And so I really just want to pick your brain as much as we can about your thoughts on the upcoming resolutions. Right. So that said, which resolutions stand out to you the most right now? Well, I, I think the one that, that I'm, there's a couple of them that I'm pretty passionate about. And, and one of them, the one in particular is disaster, the disaster response uh, committee. Um, I was a chairman of the um, committee on Masonic education and service during Hurricane Harvey. And it was um, quite an ordeal. I mean, as of course, all the brothers down on the coast know, it affected them tremendously. Mm -hmm. Um, What became very apparent to me was, is that as a committee, we were ill prepared to handle that service aspect and duty that that was assigned to us. Um, You know, this committee was officially titled the uh, Committee on Masonic Education and Service back in 1921, 100 years ago. And the service aspect really was focused on providing things like disaster response, uh, you know, when lodges were in need, when members were in need. And, you know, I went back through the history of this committee and the proceedings, and, and I can't find anywhere where that aspect of our committee where we really performed like we should have. And one of the things that was one of my goals when I became chairman was to, to fix that because I took the responsibilities that were outlined in the Grand Lodge law book, you know, that were the duties that were assigned to this committee uh, very seriously. And it became very apparent to me that we were ill prepared to deal with anything. We didn't have any infrastructure within Grand Lodge. We didn't really have any infrastructure, you know, within the, um, the state to deal with something like that. So, um, you know, we tried to um, implement some things. Uh, one of the key things is is getting uh, the district service teams involved. And that's why the district service teams to me are very important because it puts someone at a local level who's one of their job, you know, requirements would be to help when a disaster occurs. And that would be specifically the, uh, what we had in mind was the district communications officer. His role would be to, be the local, you know, brother in the district who could coordinate the needs of the lodge with, you know, the resources that are coming available from Grand Lodge and other places across the state. So um, that forming that committee is really, to me, one of the most important things we can do. Uh, the education and the education committee, education and service committee today has plenty to do from an education standpoint. You know, I mean, uh, Masonic education is key to our future. Uh, it's one of the most important things I think that, you know, can be done to ensure our future as Masons is to provide good Masonic education. But to do both that and provide for the disaster response piece is just too much for one committee to take on. It really it really requires another group of brothers dedicated to that. So um, I guess to kind of fill you in a little bit, Grandmaster uh, Curry asked me to chair the special assignments committee. And one of the assignments he gave me, uh, willingly, I took it, was to try to develop a plan to come up with a disaster response, um, you know, program, um, plan, whatever you want to call it, um, 
for the Grand Lodge of Texas. And so I recruited some brothers and uh, one who has had some real experience with uh, setting up disaster response programs in the state of Texas, uh, Brother John Machado, and, um, and also uh, recruited Brother Bill Boyd out of San Antonio, who is a, a very skillful technical writer. Um, he's just organizing things. He's great at that kind of stuff. So the two of them teamed up and they put together an outline for disaster response team. And so, of course, in order for that to happen, though, we've got to have uh, that committee created. And uh, so this resolution will help us to take that responsibility away from the Sonic Education and Service Committee and give it to its own dedicated permanent committee in Grand Lodge. And I just can't imagine why we wouldn't want to do that. Um, one of the biggest challenges I had as, as the chairman of Education and Service was I was getting phone calls from people from Grand Lodges across the country wanting to send relief. You know, uh, they wanted to send us supplies. They wanted to send us money. Uh, I had Grand Lodge calling me. Of course, Grand Lodge, the, the staff at the Grand Secretary's office was dealing with it. At the time, it was Grand Master Kirby was dealing with, you know, trying to help manage resources. Um, past Grand Master Tommy Chapman at the time was, uh, of course, he wasn't Grand Master then, but he was in that part of the state. He did a lot to help coordinate resources down there. I mean, the brothers on the coast really did a super job of stepping up and finding ways for us to send that relief down there. But it, but it, there wasn't anything, you know, set up ahead of time. So it was all seat of the pants. And everybody was really having to jump through hoops and work extra hard, you know, it's to make things happen that needed to happen. So it really, it really makes sense to have the structure in place so that we don't have to do it, you know, at the last minute and by the seat of our pants and, you know, whatever. So not only does this resolution sound very important, it, it also kind of makes you wonder how we managed to get by for so long without something like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, we just, you know, we again, it's been one of those things where you, you just deal with it as best you can when it when it happens. I mean, of course, Harvey was not the first time that we've had problems across the state. I mean, you know, this plan will encompass dealing with, you know, if we have fires, we have floods, we have uh, tornadoes, you know, whatever, hurricanes, you know. And, and the cool thing about it is, is that it will be, you know, the way that they've got this plan outlined, it'll be regionalized. Um, you know, the, the, the idea is to have regional uh, storage centers where things can be put, um, you know, to, to store so that when we need them, they'll be there. We'll have brothers in the local area who will be responsible, specifically the district communications officers, working with the rest of the district service teams. And, you know, we'll be able to coordinate a response effort, you know, into that particular area of the state that needs help. We had a lot of brothers up here. And I remember District 14 did a tremendous job during Harvey of um, gathering together a lot of, you know, like water and other non-perishable supplies and things to send down to the coast. Uh, but again, there wasn't really a something already in place to help distribute it and store it and so on and so forth. This committee and a plan will help eliminate that problem going forward. The other thing that's pretty exciting about it is, is that there's not many Grand Lodges have this. I mean, I, I contacted the um, Masonic Service Association of North America, hoping that they might have an outline or might have a, um, you know, a, just a template for us, right? To say, you know, here's how other Grand Lodges have done it. And come to find out, it hasn't really been done. So we could also be kind of the model for this and help, you know, to help other Grand Lodges put something like this in place. Wow. I mean, think about the brothers up in Kentucky right now. You know, yeah. uh, if they had a disaster response plan and team in place, then I'm sure things would be going much better for them. And of course, if we had it here in Texas, we would be better prepared to send resources to them to assist them as well. Yeah. So it's something that really needs to be done. And um, like I said, I hope the brothers of, of you know the Grand Lodge of Texas will get behind it. And I and I'm confident that we have the talent, you know, in the state here to put together a committee that can do a super job. Absolutely. So. I, I agree a hundred percent. I affected by <laughs> Harvey and you know when a lot of the times we we think of our our charitable efforts to each other 
on a lodge basis because we know each other's needs and we go and help each other. And, and that's, that's very relevant in our lodge. You know, when, when the freeze came, we all checked on each other and made sure that everybody was okay. And, and um, you know, when a brother's down, we'll go mow his, his hay field for him and, and get that thing taken care of things like that. But when Harvey hits, you know, it hit everybody. So everybody down here was so busy just trying to keep up with cutting trees. And like me, one of the most or one of the more active members of my lodge, more capable of doing things. I was working from seven in the morning until 11 at night trying to get people's phone and Internet and and, and all of their communication services back up and running. So. I was kind of out of the picture. I couldn't help a whole lot. So having those teams in place and, and Texas is so diverse. We have our, our natural disasters, of course, and the tornadoes up in North Texas, so North Texas tornado alley. You know, I grew up in Louisville. I know that threat for real. And, and then we have our, our plants all over the place that our chemical plants, our, our industries that, you know, things go wrong all the time. And, and we should be there as, as a group. We should be just as relevant as, as any other group out there with our trailer, with our name on it, showing that we're there to help. You know, yeah. that should definitely. And even if it's not <sighs> to the whole public, even if it's just to deliver to our guys to where they can disperse as they need it, as they see fit in the community, just being there, just just being a part of it, whereas we're not right now. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And no, I, I will talk that up all day long. Any yeah, plan think, is better than no plan. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, initially we wanted to have the infrastructure in place to support the lodges, the members, the families. and But ultimately, I'd, I'd like to model ourselves after the Texas Baptist Men's. You know, and they, they do a tremendous job. And you think about the resources that the Grand Lodge of Texas has and the number of lodges and the number of m members across the state. There's no reason in the world why we couldn't be just as effective as they are. So Absolutely. You know. $10 from each member a year, and we would be funded for the next 20 years. Whoa. whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. <laughs> you talk about an increase. Yeah, you know how that's going to go. That was one of the questions that came up. I did a, a presentation of the resolutions for our uh, MWSA up in 84 here a couple of weeks ago. And one of the questions was, well, how is this going to be funded? And, and the truth is, is it, it really, we, we had money, you know, the money wasn't an issue. I mean, as soon as the need arose, the money started coming in, you know, to right. support it. And not just from the Grand Lodge of Texas and the members of the Grand Lodge of Texas, but across the country. And the, the problem was, is, well, now what do we do with it? Because we didn't right. really have a plan, you know, to, to implement it and distribute it where it was needed. So we've got money, um, you know, some money set aside already. It's just a matter of now figuring out how to use it effectively. Right. So what, what you're saying for those that are listening is this will not directly result in a per capita increase or anything like that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to scare the masses with, with what I said. That's for that, sure. That will kill any resolution, no matter how good it is. <laughs> Even though I'll personally volunteer to to give out ten dollars scholarships to at least fifty people, how's that? <laughs> no, we just need brothers to devote some time and effort to it, and I think we'll be just fine. Absolutely, absolutely. So that one's I'm pretty passionate about that one. Um, Understandably, though. Yeah, that's what? a good one. So what what's your what's your next the next one that that comes to your mind? Well, the, other, the next one I think is a little bit more fun and not nearly as, um, I guess, serious is, um, is that um, the music in our degrees was taken out in 1934, officially. It's not, it, you know, all but the uh, funeral dirge and the master's degree uh, was taken out of the monitor. Prior to that, we had music for each of the degrees. And... So um, Brother Lance Candler, uh, who happens to be our patients <laughs> officer in 84, he is a, uh, you know, uh, trained musician and he plays the piano very, very well, by the way. But um, but he's a, a musician and I'm not. But I, I believe that there's a real advantage to having music as part of the, the degrees if a lodge chooses to do that. Absolutely. It is something that our brothers had 
back in the you know 1800s, uh, you know during the early years of the Grand Lodge of Texas. It's it's in the Taylor Monitor. It's in the Taylor <laughs> Hamilton Monitor. It's in the uh, official monitor of the Grand Lodge of Texas, the Boone Monitor, which wasn't officially adopted. But all the way up until Lightfoot's Monitor, um, music was an integral part of the degrees or could be. And I just want to be able to give lodges the option to bring that music back if they choose to. Um, not something that's required, um, but it's also very clear in the resolution that the goal is, is that we're going to bring it back. But also we want to standardize it so that if, you know, if, if one lodge, you do it in this lodge, you do it this way, it's done the same. And, and all the lodges, just like our ritual work is done, that there is an, a, 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 an adopted, recognized uh, sheet music and lyrics. And, uh, and part of this resolution would put a, a request to the Education and Service Committee to create the training material that would show lodges, you know, if you're going to do it, here's the proper way to do it. And of course, we work hand in hand with the committee on work because that's their purview. But, you know, education educates and uh, the, the committee on work would, would, you know, help us develop a standardized version of the music and so on and so forth, which truthfully, um, I've already worked with Brother Candler. We've researched all the monitors and we've already done the heavy lifting as far as this is concerned uh, and created uh, the sheet music, the lyrics, and um, sample audio of the music um, as it was done, you know, historically in Texas. Wow. So, I've had know. the pleasure of meeting Lance a few times. He's a, he's a great brother and, and very passionate about music. So this, I think this is very positive. It definitely would be a good change. Um, do we know why the music was originally taken out? You know, I'm, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I can only speculate, and that would be that it was um, just, you know, kind of like uh, moving the lights around, the, the lesser lights. It was just something that they really didn't do it often enough, or they didn't really understand why they were doing it, or maybe they didn't get enough, you know, uh, brothers to, you know, help in the singing or whatever. And I don't know, but you know, it's funny that Lightfoot would be the one to take it out because if anything, I would have thought he would have been the one to put it in. I was actually, all the other <laughs> things that he did in his monitor, you know, I would have thought that if anything, he would have enhanced it. I thought the same thing when you, when you mentioned that, because Lightfoot, it's a pretty, it's a pretty thick monitor as it is. It has quite a bit of content in it. So I'm surprised he would have taken that out. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, with another discussion with a brother lately, um, I was talking about why we don't have the musicians in the lodges and things like that. Those, those officer positions. And uh, he was saying, well, you know, nobody can play piano or whatever. And I told him, well, we have three musicians in our lodge that actively play music and, and do those things, but you just don't know that. So, you know, that's, it's sometimes it's, it's, it's fallen back on the old, ways of thinking of, you know, that's not how we did it in my year kind of mentality. And, and it blocks your judgment on, on what can happen now. And today with today's technology, there is no reason we can't have a nice sound system and have an actual, a, a digital copy that will sound pristine in no matter what lodge it is. So well, you know, one of we could things, create that. Yeah. One of the things that we talked to the committee of work about is, is that, you know, the, the music, there's potential that the music may be able to be recorded if you don't have a musician. But I think everyone would be encouraged to have a musician and have it played live. But I think it's going to absolutely be a requirement that if, the, if, it's, if there's any singing done, then it's done by the members that are there. Right. You know? So you don't do recorded vocals. It'll be right, sung right. by the members. Which, and, and I'm talking mainly of the background music, yeah. you know, the instrumental part because not everybody is a pianist and not everybody can you know strum a, a violin or, or a guitar or what have you so you know that would be nice to have in the background is it because it's hard enough just keeping these guys in time with the funeral procession you know <laughs> so so well, it would be not, nice to have that in the background to keep them <laughs> you know so right. this would help to this would help fix that problem as well. It would come say, here's here's the way that you know it should be done. Do your best to do it as well as you can. You know, so uh, I'm excited say, about that. And that that leads to 
one of the Grand Master's recommendations, which was also a special assignments, was asked to look at the possibility of updating the monitor. The monitor hasn't been, you know, um, significantly updated in 40 years. So it's time to look at it and consider, you know, making some improvements. And so uh, we had a committee within the committee that made recommendations on how we might improve the monitor. And so the Grand Master is putting forth a recommendation to create an official committee to actually um, do an updated version of the monitor, which I'm very excited about and would love to be a part of because I think there's a lot of things that we can add and a lot and some things that we can clarify, uh, some things that aren't in there that should be in there, mm -hmm. uh, some ceremonies that we, can, we actually are asked to do but don't have a ritual for or don't have a ceremony for, not necessarily ritual, but we don't have a ceremony for. So I think we can, we can clear up some things, make some corrections and add some things that will give it even more value. My goal would be to have it be the monitor that every Grand Lodge aspires to have one like, you know, uh, maybe better illustrations, so on and so forth. So uh, I think that would be pretty exciting. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that one getting passed as well. Are there, are there, is there any conversation about taking anything out of that monitor? Um, you know, I, I don't think so. I mean, again, it would be one of those things where the committee would probably just have to evaluate it. Um, and again, I think go back to um, the older monitors and maybe bring back some of the stuff that's not in the current monitor and clarify some things. I mean, I can think of some things, for example, um, the trestle board in the uh, entered apprentice degree in the current monitor is actually a combination of what was two, two trestle boards in other monitors or at least different sections. And so it, when you look at it in this monitor, it can be confusing. And so we can See. clarify some of that stuff. Very interesting. Yeah. And of course, we can also always improve the, the glossary um, that's in the back, which I think is a great tool, but it's got some words in there that we don't use. And it's got some words in there that probably are missing. So things like that. Like per blind. <laughs> <laughs> we need to, we actually need to clarify those type, type of things <laughs> and, and standardize, standardize those, uh, those, those things. Yeah. But you know, who am I to say? Yeah, that would, uh, it, it, ha it having been so long since it had been updated, it really makes sense. It's, it's, it's past time. It's due for a uh, a reevaluation. Yeah. We should also, we should be actively doing that on a regular basis. <laughs> just going at, at some point, we have to realize, you know, what what's we have to look at everything as a what's working, what's not, where can we improve, where can we, you know, yeah. leave it, you know, because there there's too much of that's not how we've done it. And there's too, and sometimes there's too much of, you know, why don't we do it this way? You know? So I, I think we should always be on the cutting edge of, of, of reevaluating everything and, and, and uh, making decisions based on what's best for the fraternity. Well, the other thing is, is you can see, I like books a lot and, and I would like it to be a book. Not a oh, yes. Book. A hard copy. <laughs> yeah, leather a hard bound. copy book that, you know, yes. is, is manageable in size. At least have the option for that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I know there's lots of brothers that want it in a digital format. And, and absolutely, we should be able to do that as well. But I think having the option for a, a you know, a manageable hard copy version of that would be fabulous. So that's another thing that I, I would look to do. So I'm excited about it. I think I think that it will will be uh, adopted and um, and I look forward to being a part of it if, if the opportunity comes up. So it's definitely exciting to, to think that we might do something like that. Yeah. The other um, Grandmaster's recommendation has to do with the um, graduate advisories board. There's a committee that, you know, was responsible for providing guidance to graduates of the home and school, but of course the home and school is no longer. And so that committee really doesn't have a lot to do. And so, um, he asked us to look at that and, um, you know, he, he came up, I, I think, with the idea that, you know, let's make that a committee now that's responsible for the, um, you know, widows and orphans, which I think is tremendous. So I, I can't imagine that that anyone would, would have a problem with that. And um, so I, I look forward to that one coming through. 
another one that the um, special assignments was tasked with and um, was to look at the, um, the, the possibility of creating a matching grant program for lodges to do improvement. And, and the grant master came up with a great idea. And, you know, that is uh, to do it, you know, kind of fashioned after the, um, uh, the program that already exists for, you know, fraternal assistance fund that's managed by the finance committee. And so this would um, create a program where lodges could apply for matching grants to make improvements in their lodges, which again, it, you know, it's not asking for a per capita increase. Uh, <laughs> just to, just to be clear. <laughs> that, that we can, you know, tap into. And so lodges would have the ability to apply for that. So I think it's tremendous, you know, if the lodge can come up with a couple thousand dollars to do some improvements, then, then ideally Grand Lodge would be able to come back and, and offer them, you know, a matching couple thousand dollars to help them get it done. So I think, I think that, that would happen. That would be huge. Yeah. There's so, so many lodges that need to be able to, yeah. to, to work on their building and, and finances is a problem for them. Yeah, I, I think I'm excited about, you know, uh, some other resolutions that are being put forth too that we had absolutely nothing to do with, but I think they will greatly benefit, uh, the, you know, the lodges in Texas. Our uh, grand treasurers putting forth along with, you know, I think he in concert with the grand secretary are putting forth a resolution to lift some of the limitations on the disbursement of funds from the you know, lodge endowment uh, uh, fund. Number so, 26. Yes. Yeah. So that, that one, I can't imagine why anybody would be against that. I mean, that's tremendous. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to pretty much be ensured that, you know, lodges will get a, a, a distribution every year. Cause you know, there's some years there a, a while back where we didn't get any money. Uh, and now not only will we uh, get money, but you know, may get a little bit more, which is terrific. So that'll be great. Um, and, then and we've discussed this before that, you know, with, with uh, with that particular resolution, it, it just goes to show the the lot the Grand Lodge leading by example in they have streamlined our processes so much on the by utilizing technology and saved us so much money that we can do that kind of thing. And so, if lodges would do that kind of thing and and streamline their services and utilize technology to the best of its ability, instead of being afraid of it grasp it and and run with it then who knows what what kind of money that they may come up with for other other projects around that need to be done yeah it'll be it'll be exciting to see those get passed and um there's actually two other ones that are they're really pretty much the same and, and I'm, I'm i'm guessing that they may be combined at grand lodge but uh, uh there's two resolutions out there to create uh the office of um, lodge historian and uh, one where they actually want to create a historian and a, um, I want to say a, uh, an order. Um, but anyways, I, you know, that having a, a, an additional offices available for lodges to add to their bylaws, um, I would like to see us add a librarian uh, as an official because, you know, I think uh, having a library in the lodge is a great resource for the brothers and, and having someone responsible for building a library in the lodge would be great. So, I might actually ask to amend that one and, and include the office of librarian with historian. So, but um, it yes. should be fun. That should be, that, that is a twofold position. If you think about it, I mean, your, your historian is really, he has to go into the, the books of the library to, to, to put together the, the, uh, information of the lodge and so it only makes sense that that those go hand in hand together i think that's a great idea mm -hmm. and and not only that but then create the resources to teach these guys how to handle the 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 old books and how to handle the minutes and how to make the digital copies and and what can and cannot be done legally and 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 you know within our own uh, grasp, you know, I, I think that's an excellent idea, excellent yeah. idea, because we need to do that so badly now before it's too late. The silverfish are, are loving the, the, the local lodges, that's for sure. If, if, if only there was a knowledgeable brother, say maybe from Waco, that was very, very good at history. <laughs> I was thinking the same reach thing. Out to. 
<laughs> yeah, well, you know, we have we have uh, we have several brothers within the fraternity who are very knowledgeable in how to do that. Mm-hmm. Who would be great resources. So yeah, it's uh, like I said, I'm we- excited. There's some great great resolutions coming forward that will do nothing but help improve mainstream in Texas, and we just need to get behind them. I love it. My- the secretary of my lodge, like in Waco, is a historian and he's the director of the Presidio and he does that kind of stuff for a living. So, you know, if, if we had these great minds together talking about it and coming up with solutions for the lodges and I'm sorry, guys, these guys are not 60 years old. They're more in their 30s and 40s, but they're smart guys. But if we had these guys, you know, saving our history and and preserving you know what what we've worked so hard for what what our ancestors have worked so hard for we're just riding the coattails we need to you know do something about it and and really you know be good caretakers of of the gifts we've been given i really resonate with what larry said um earlier in the interview when he said that education is, is really the future of our fraternity everything Everything moving forward is is built on that, and you, I, I'm sorry, but reading comes hand in hand with education. It's just you can't have one really without the other. And so, having a a well maintained, up to date, well stocked library in your lodge that is accessible to the brothers, uh, that'd be a a huge step forward. And so having a librarian that can actually maintain that would be necessary. But I, I love that we're at this point in, in Freemasonry here in Texas that we feel like these things are necessary now. We feel like historians are necessary. Librarians are necessary. Things like this, this emphasis on education, it's, it's a very positive movement, in my opinion. Yeah, it'll be fun. I'm really looking forward to it. I, I think there'll there'll be some really good things coming out of this grand lodge. Unfortunately, I don't see anything that's you know real controversial in the resolutions and, mm-hmm. and the recommendations. So you know, most of them, a lot of them are just some consolidation, name changes, and district realignments and things like that that will go through. I think pretty seamlessly, and <laughs> and so hopefully it will be um, you know a, a, a great session, and everybody's going to go away feeling a lot better. Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic, you know, that's that's one thing that um, being as close to Grand Lodge as I have been for the last 10 plus years um, really makes me feel good about our future and where we're headed. Absolutely. So absolutely. Good. Yeah, the um, that's one of the first things I look for when we get new resolutions is anything that might be controversial, um, just because. Let's be frank. It's interesting to sit through and listen to it, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, let's, let's stir it up a little. Yeah. Bit. Yeah. Let's... But everything with, I mean, there's a few things that I'm not huge on, but there's nothing that I read that I was like, that's going to cause any kind of controversy or anything like that. The majority of the resolutions all look very positive. Like everything we discussed, uh, these are all very positive changes if they get adopted. Well, and we've talked about this before in other in other conversations with other guests here lately that, you know, the 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 lodges, the the fraternity in it in itself is is really taking a, a positive shift that, yes, we may be losing membership due to, you know, the the um, the past generations, you know, going, you know, leaving us and and all the joiners that of, of the day of the sixties of the fifties and sixties are, are, are starting to leave us. And, and so we're going to shrink down a little bit, but on the other hand, we're, we're starting to get back to the basics and get back to the meat and, and potatoes of, of what Freemasonry is about. And, and what Grand Lodge is doing is only reinforcing the capabilities of that and, and helping us to achieve that and, and modeling good stewardship with technology and, and, um, and the assets of the most important assets are our people. And, and. So you're to, saying, to, you're saying we get, we're, we're getting to the meat and potatoes and moving away from the green beans and pancakes. Absolutely. <laughs> it's about time. <laughs> I, I'm ready for I'm I'm ready for filet mignon. I don't know about you guys, but but I kind of like filet mignon. 
Yeah, well, that's education in my book. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Larry, we, we've talked quite a bit about the upcoming resolutions. I'd like to uh, talk about you a little bit now. Uh, would you just tell us a little bit about your background, uh, such as why you joined Freemasonry? Well, I like to tell everyone that I actually became a Mason when I was about nine years old. And, um, and that's because when I was uh, about nine years old, I was playing Little League Baseball, and the local Masonic Lodge sponsored our baseball team. And we all, we were the Masons and we had ball caps and, um, but we didn't, we didn't get to wear the square compasses. We had a, a an M on there, but we were the Masons <laughs> and our coaches were Very Masons cool. from the local lodge. So, um, you know, that was for me, was, was kind of neat. Cause I didn't have any idea, of course, what they were, who they were. And, and I, I remember asking my dad and he said, yeah, they meet above the, the, um, you know, the little department store over here in town in old town. Um, he said, the windows are always closed. And he says, I think they wear aprons or something. And it was like, and yeah, he says, other than that, we don't know what they do. But I soon found out that my barber, my bus driver, my mailman, my high school principal, um, the, the, the gentleman who ran the gas station where I took all my empty co- you know, Coke bottles to get two cents a piece for, all these guys were Masons and, and, and actually so, several more. And, and the funny thing about it is um, my dad at the time, he had he ran a gas station at the other end of town uh, for a while, but he also had a little diner in town. And I worked there after school and, and a lot of these guys would come in there and uh, they took an interest in me. And, um, you know, they always want to know how my grades were. They want to know how I was doing sports and, you know, whatever, you know, that, but they took a genuine interest in me. And I could tell that they genuinely cared about the young men in the community, not just me. And, you know, and it was one of those little towns where, you know, they say, you know, that the, the um, you're, you're raised by the village, you know, or you're raised by the town. It's not just your parents. And because because, you know, if we ever did anything wrong, uh, my parents knew about it before I got home, you know, because everybody talked, everybody knew everybody, everybody knew whose kid you were, you know, that kind of thing. But they were also all looking out for you. And uh, and these guys really took an interest in me. And, and I appreciated that. And um, and so I was always interested, you know, I was, I was curious. And so um, I, um, I was in an old bookstore because I, that's another thing. I always like to read. And I found a copy of Morals and Dogma and I thought I'd found the treasure, you know, to King's Tut tomb or, or whatever. I mean, it was just the most <laughs> fascinating thing I'd ever picked up in my entire life. And so I started reading about I, everything I could get my hands on about Freemasonry. And I did that for probably 25 years before I joined. And, um, but, and of course, when I joined, I thought I knew everything there was to know because I well, books. I was going to say, if you read that many books over that long a time, you probably were more knowledgeable than a lot of the guys in the lodge. <laughs> probably. You know? The funny thing is, though, is that as soon as I took my first degree, I realized how little I really did. And then it would become, then it really became, you know, a serious quest to really begin to understand what it's all about and, and what its purpose is and so on and so forth. So, I've been doing that ever since and loving every minute of it. So, so that, that kind of, you, you kind of answered uh, another question that we usually ask and which I would like to dig a little bit deeper into it. And that is, you know, how did, um, how did your experience unfold? I mean, how, how did your expectations, how were they met once you went through the degrees and, and became a member once you, especially with you, having read all that information and then going through your local lodge, how, how did those expectations match up and be honest, it's okay. We're, we're, <laughs> well, we, we've yeah, all we can, been, we can edit little... anything out, Larry. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. He can edit anything. Yeah. Well, I'll, I will tell you that I was very fortunate to have brothers who knew the ritual very well. And I, I love the ritual and, uh, you know, if there was anything else I would be doing, it would be, well, I'm the district instructor up here. And so I get to do it anytime I want to, but you know, I, I love the ritual and I had brothers uh, that taught me and taught me well and uh, who were very well versed in it. So that was, that was a great thing. But when it came to really understanding what it meant, of course they didn't, um, you know, they, they had some ideas and they had some thoughts, but you know, it became very apparent that, you know, they were just repeating things that they'd heard, but they really didn't have a good understanding for themselves. So for me, that was an opportunity. You know, I started to, you know, 
give them some thoughts on, well, you know, maybe there's something like this that, it, you know, that it could mean. And and so that was an opportunity for me to kind of test the waters and, in, in, you know, as far as teaching was concerned. And uh, so I got to, you know, help teach the teacher, and, but from a different aspect, of course. And so, you know, and, and fortunately, um, they were very open to that. I mean, our lodge, um, you know, 20 years ago was pretty much one that played dominoes and, and, and did a great job doing the degrees, but didn't do a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, as far as education was concerned, anyways. And so uh, and, and from an administrative standpoint, too. You know, uh, we, it was kind of one of those things where if you got to be the, you know, if you went in the kitchen, you ended up in the East and, you know, eight, seven or eight years or whatever, you just went through the chairs. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, there was another brother in the lodge and, that, and I that felt very passionate about having jobs and role, you know, roles and job descriptions and duties assigned to each office. So that as you progress to the chairs, not only did you have more to do, and different things to do, but you learned along the way. And so by the time you got to the East, you were prepared. You know, there wasn't right. anything in that lodge that you hadn't touched that you didn't know how to deal with because you'd already done it. And and, and the, one of the greatest moments for me personally was um, seeing a brother, um, his name was Brian Lee, who filled in as junior deacon. And um, because our other junior, our uh, installed junior deacon had his job took him out of town, so he never could fill the position. And so this young master mason filled that position, did a great job. And the next year we installed him in that position, and he was the first one to really go from there all the way to the east. And he was kind of shy, timid, didn't want to speak in front of a crowd, um, didn't you know, just wasn't real outgoing at all. But when he was installed as worship master for the first time. He gave one of the best speeches I'd ever heard anyone give during their installation. And, and masonry changed him and made wow. him a better man. So we saw firsthand that it can work if it's done right. Yeah. And um, so it was awesome, you know, and, and he went on to be worshipful master the second time so that another brother, because someone had to leave and, um, you know, he didn't want to have to have that brother skip a chair so that he could go through the same experience that he did. So he agreed to sit in as worship master again. So it's awesome. The type of lodge you described to me um, with the, with the dominoes and the degrees and everything, uh, a lot of people would look at that as a healthy lodge. Uh, I've heard it compared to like, like a, like a lake that's a mile wide and an inch deep. It, there may be a lot to it, but the depth is, is very shallow you may have brothers that know a lot, but they can't explain it. They may, they may know everything verbatim, but if you pry or try to dig any deeper, that's as far as it goes. They can't explain anything, but, but I love what you just all in that book. Yeah. All that's what book. I hear. It's all in that book. Oh yeah. 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 It's all in the book. Just read the book. Yeah. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but the, the policies and procedures that you described implemented, I uh, I have seen other lodges do that, and I I agree wholeheartedly. Um, it creates, first of all, people l- say like a like a, your stewards or or your your deacons, they need to have their new masons. Usually, they need to have concrete roles. They need to know exactly what their job is, what their expectations are, and so if you can establish those, and granted. We talk about it installation, but most of the time our people's eyes glaze over because it's already been you already been sitting through quite a bit. So actually having it formalized on paper and, and, and saying this is what we expect of you, and then allowing the progressive line, which I don't I don't necessarily think you should just and that's not what you're describing, but I'm just saying I don't think you should allow it to just just go just for the sake of going. But all things being um, ideal, uh, a brother goes through that progressive line and, and takes on those roles and, and, and fulfills those in each seat. By the time he is a warden and, and especially the worship master, um, he's got quite a bit of skin in the game as far as the lodge's success. And he's, he's grown quite a bit and developed like you described uh, with the brother that was very, very yeah. quiet, which I can relate to because that was me as well. Well, 
you know, the thing is, is, it, is it, why would you expect a guy that does a, you know, a poor job as um, junior deacon or senior deacon, or he does a poor job as a steward, mm-hmm. why would you expect him to do a better job at the next step? Absolutely. You know, he's not, you know, I mean, if he does, you're just lucky, but you know, the, you, you, there's got to be some accountability. Yeah. But and, he's a real you know, good guy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, may, he might be a great guy, but he just, you know, just not doing the job. And, and the sooner we realize that, you know, our lodges have to run like a business to some degree. Absolutely. You know, it yes, has sir. to, because you have to pay the light bill. You have to keep the place up. You have to, you have to maintain or improve, you know, constantly your, your facilities, whatever. And if you don't do the basic fundamental stuff like you would for a business, then your lodge isn't going to survive. And you won't, you'll be putting out fires and dealing with problems rather than having time to deal with the fun stuff, which is what you join for. You know, it's the education, it's the understanding, it's the, you know, that camaraderie that, you know, guys come for and, you know, whatever, because you're, you're fighting problems or you're arguing about this or money or, you know, all that stuff goes away. If you've got a well-run, you know, well-run lodge or well-run business effectively. I, I love everything you said. It's about being proactive versus being reactive. And yeah. too often we turn a blind eye to the progressive line. Uh, we have brothers like you described. Uh, he, he may not be fulfilling his role as junior deacon, but he's a nice guy. Everyone likes him. So we'll go ahead and promote him to senior deacon. Maybe he'll, without understanding that he won't necessarily do a better job if he's not fulfilling the role he's in now, but in order to avoid hurt feelings or any kind of problems now, we go ahead and advance him through the line without thinking by the time he's a warden or a worship master, if he hasn't developed and he's not showing signs that he is, and if he hasn't developed by then, it's going to create a lot worse problems now or down the road than it will right now if we, if we do something. Absolutely. I have, I have two thoughts on, on, on both of those. You may share one. one. I can't do that. (laughs) You you know better, you know better. So the, the very first thought is it will be real quick is, and, and that is, you know, you progress the guy that's the nice guy because maybe he's a nice guy, or maybe you're afraid that he's going to leave the lodge and, and you'll lose that per capita because you've only got three members to begin with. So now you, you really need that guy, you know, in your lodge and, and you got to have them, whatever. So the, the real question there would be how many members are you losing because you've got that guy in that position? You know, that's, that's what people forget to think about is, is what are they losing with, with these lodges where they aren't doing enough? They're not well-rounded lodges. They're not, they're not doing the things that Mason should be doing. You don't have any kind of education. You don't have anything but fellowship and paying the bills. That's not enough to keep today's man interested. And, it's something we overlook a lot. Well, my second, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> my second thing real quick was just, I was very fortunate that the worshipful master that made me senior deacon, um, we skipped a lot of it because our stewards, they like to uh, be stewards. And so, and I'll go into that a little bit too. So the guy that made me senior deacon, he, uh, he went with me to officer leadership training. Now I went to both sessions um, in the same year because I wanted to be prepared and get prepared. And he went with me on the second session and he learned a lot as well. And so we were able to start implementing the things that we learned in those sessions. And like with the stewards, for instance, our stewards are the best cooks around. So what we do is we have, you know, a few guys that the younger guys that we put form as like a committee that to help them that's their jobs to help them help them clean up help them you know do the do the the rough and tough stuff and that way they can get to the business of cooking good food for us and you know just different things like that and then as you go along in your positions you know the the senior warden should always be in charge of fundraising for the next year he should be making his own money for the next year you know the the junior warden should be focused on on um, 
developing, helping develop committees and, and share taking care of your building and, and building that up. You know, there, there's j- different areas that you don't learn unless you either have good mentors in your lodge or you go to something and, and, and utilize the education that Grand Lodge offers through officer, officer leadership training. That's, that's, that's going to be my plug for that because I, I, I firmly agree. I firmly believe in it. I think some of the best Masons I've, I've seen going through the chairs in the past five years have, have I've seen them go through the, the process and I've seen the guys that teach it live it. And, and I think that it's, it's a testimony to itself. And our lodge was one of those, you know, wide but not so deep lodges when I joined in, in Goliad. And now we're one of the, the thriving lodges. We're the guys that go around and, and try to help all the other lodges in the district and even outside of our district to, to, to try and help them, you know, revive themselves, you know, out of the rural depression that, that everybody seems to get themselves in. The, the rural depression. I like that. <laughs> I'm going to be a little bit of a hypocrite because I have never been to an officer training. I'd like to. It just hasn't hasn't ever worked out. But I will be a hypocrite because I think every new warden should go to it and every worship master should go to it. I, I've, I haven't I have been. I'll repeat that. But I've heard <laughs> enough good things that I know that there is value in it, uh, particularly if you've never been a warden or a worship master. Um, so I will also plug that, I suppose. I, I also, I also want to say, um, very quickly, cause I don't want to, I don't want to dominate the, the discussion too much, but I also want to say you were talking, we were talking earlier about advancing people through the line before they're ready. And when people ask what we do, as a fraternity, what's the typical, what's, what's our canned response is that we take them better. Exactly. Exactly. We say we take good men and make them better. However, if we are advancing people through the, through the line that are not showing signs of improving, that are not showing signs of, of, of becoming better and develop leadership skills, then we're doing not only, our fraternity a disservice, but we're doing them a disservice because we are, we are promoting them and advancing them and rewarding them for, for not putting the work in. And that's what they join for. That's what we tell them we do. So it's reasonable to presume that's what they are joining for. Well, you know, one of the arguments that I get when I bring this up is as well, you know, we're a small lodge. We don't have that many brothers to pick from. We have a hard enough time filling the chairs as it is. You know, so it's like, you know, well, we, we don't have any choice but to put somebody there. And and, that, and sometimes that's going to be the case. But ideally, at least you're going to have someone that is trying, you know, that they're they're trying to fulfill the role. They're doing the best that they can. And in that case, you just rally around the brothers and you try to, you know, get him the help he can to make him succeed so that, you know, he does feel good about himself and he does progress and he does get better. You know, that's that's the thing. But you, you have to at least start with someone who's got the right attitude. And, and a lot of that is making sure that you set the proper expectations, which goes back to why we wrote, uh, you know, rules and regulations, which defined the roles and duties of all the officers, and as well, all of the, the, the committees and the roles of those committees and, and who those committees are composed of, so that the expectations are there. And so before you sign up, here's what we're going to expect of you. You know, and yeah, you may not be able to do it all right off the bat, but the good news is you've got brothers that are willing to help you. And so that that's the way you get around it. The other thing is you have to be patient. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. It didn't get screwed up overnight and it's not going to get fixed overnight. So it took us a good 10 years uh, at our lodge to get to a point where we really just, you know, we enjoy the opportunity to be Masons. You know, fundraisers are important, but they're not nearly as important as they used to be. You know, we're not dipping into the pockets of the brother and to pay the bills. Right. You know, it's, so it's definitely a process and it's also an uphill battle. Yep. But it's worthwhile. And it's constant. It's perpetual. You you can't let go. I mean, you got to keep doing it. Mm-hmm. I think one of the most important things we can do as past masters is support that that master. And and really 
take the mindset that I want you to have the best year that you're ever going to have. And I'm going to support you in making it the best year you're ever going to have because you wanted that. And so help him to, to, to su- support that master and, and help him do everything that, it, and, and it's like on the Grand Lodge level too, you know, the, the job of the district deputies is to, you know, of course, get the message out to the district, but help that Grand Master have the best year that he's, he's ever going to have because he's only going to have that one. So, you know, make it good, you know, make everything there. There's no reason to, 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 to downplay everything that, that the, that the guy's bringing in, you know, help him to succeed. That's, that's our best gift to, to that master. I thought after we were worship master, we were supposed to disappear and never come back. Is that not in the monitor or anything like that? I thought that was the, I thought that was a standard, but no, I, uh, I absolutely agree. Absolutely. I think, it's um, I don't know that it's human nature, but I think something we unfortunately see is we often compare our year in the East to other people's. And so we want our year to be the best year in recent recent history. And so um, we we don't give the either the the current master or the master that comes after us the support that we really probably should. We can be selfish. We can be selfish. I guess that's, that's the, the takeaway from that is unfortunately we're humans and we can be selfish, but we need to, we need to uh, set that ego up on the shelf and, and, and be selfless for our fraternity. Eliminating the ego is probably one of the things that is, should be foremost throughout the fraternity. And, uh, you know, doing what's best for the lodge and its members is really what should be the forefront. And same Absolutely. thing with the Grand Lodge. You know, what's best for the Grand Lodge of Texas, not any one individual. Yeah. So. Yeah. And take advantage of of the the guys that are smarter in the room than you. You know, one of my my best memories in in recent history uh, happened a couple of years ago, and and it's sad that it. Well, I've had some pretty good ones here lately, but a couple of years ago that. I remember when Larry and I and, and Chris and, and Keith Reynolds even and uh, and Brad were all sitting up in the hotel room talking about different philosophical things. Now, having Keith in the room with philosophical talk is no, that's that's borderline heresy. But <laughs> but that was that was one of the most amazing times in, in, in my Masonic journey. And I, I absolutely loved it. And that's what I'm striving for today. Right. And so that's why we have Larry here right now. Yes. And so my goal is to take the knowledge from these these guys that are brilliant and bring it to my lodge and 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 have those same kind of meaningful uh, moments in in masonry with these guys, just just like they did for me, because I I felt like the the this most ignorant guy in the world sitting there talking to these geniuses, but you know that it meant the world to me. But I one thing brag about that day every day. One thing that I've learned, um, because I've also pursued what you're talking about, trying to surround myself with with more educated masons than myself. One thing I've learned is what you think about another brother, he may think the same thing about you. So you may think this guy is a lot years ahead of me in Freemasonry, but he may also say, Oh man, this Dennis Yates, that guy's on Masonic improvement. He's a, <laughs> he's a big deal. You know, it's, it's, it's happened and it's happened. Surprisingly, it's happened with me as well. And, and why and, haven't you told me this before? I, well, you always, you always want to edit me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just saying, um, you never no, know. I, I get it. I get you it. never know. And, and yes. it's, it's, it's all, it's, it's definitely very humbling when it, when it turns out to be you, but it's, um, we're very fortunate. And I've said this before, we are very fortunate to live in a jurisdiction with oh. so many knowledgeable brothers. We Granted, know. it's a huge jurisdiction, but anywhere, anywhere in Texas, there are extremely knowledgeable brothers that you can, that you can seek out. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's one of the things I was always amazed at with officer leadership training was going around the state and, and getting to meet some of these guys. And some, I mean, I will tell you that I learned as much about masonry 
that officer leadership training as the, you know, as the guys did. I mean, I learned as much from them as they learned from us. And that was what was, that was very cool. It really, really was. So you, you guys inspired me to run around with, with officer leadership this past year. And, and it was, it was the most rewarding experience seeing, seeing these guys have their aha moments, just like I did. And, you know, it just really, it really just brought it home, you know, every, every time. And, and then sitting with them afterwards, having a, a beer or whatever, and, and talking about all this cool stuff that they learned. And, and then I learned just as much from them and doing it, just rehashing it and, and reminding myself why I, I really enjoyed what, what we did. Love it. So um, Dennis, Larry, this has been an excellent conversation. Uh, we are, we are getting close to that time. Do either of you have any parting thoughts that you would like to share? Go ahead, Larry. Well, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that I think was on the list that we didn't get to talk about was our strengths and weaknesses. I think as a fraternity, you know, our, 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 our biggest strength is our heritage and, uh, you know, in Texas in particular, as far as Freemasonry is concerned, but also, you know, it, as we mentioned earlier, just there's a, a large number of brothers across the state are very knowledgeable very committed, um, dedicated to the fraternity. And we need to take advantage of that. And, um, and, and we need to just, you know, stay engaged, don't give up, be patient, work together and, and set the egos aside and just do what's best for, for masonry in Texas. And, and if we go out there and demonstrate masonry as it should be, then uh, we'll be just fine. You know, we don't have to worry about membership. We don't have to worry about money. Uh, we'll be just fine. So, you know, uh, just keep plugging away, you know, I know that I will. Is, I'm having way too much fun. Yes, yeah, exactly. Here. That that's exactly what what Justin and I state every every time. And, and that very same thing. And and along with what Justin said, you know, prior and and what you said, it, you know, we do have the resources all over our state. And Justin and I happen to know a lot of these resources. So if if you're out there feeling like you're in that lodge that 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 doesn't that doesn't have a lot of depth and you need some help. You know, that's what we're here for. That's what Masonic Improvement is here for, is to get you in touch with the Larrys out there, the the Chris's, the, you know, the Justin's, the the Robert Marshall's. You know, we're here to help you find that help that you need because we're all in it together and we want to improve on on our fraternity as a whole, not just as not just hear ourselves talk on 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 YouTube. Yeah. I love it. Dennis, uh, Larry, uh, thank you both again for taking time out of your day to, uh, to, uh, join in on this. Uh, but Dennis, you really have a choice. I kind of pulled you into this, but Larry, for sure, <laughs> Larry, for sure. Definitely appreciate you taking time out of your Wednesday evening to uh, come and talk with us today. Thank you. Larry. Thank you guys. I really appreciate, appreciate what you're doing too. Keep it up. Appreciate that. Thank All right, you. brothers until next time. <laughs>